Well, welcome everyone. Good to see everybody here. We're glad that you are joining us for the CESA Star Party. I think people are still uh, trickling in, but um, welcome to all who are joining us. Uh, my name is Dr. Kristen Miller, and um, I'm the faculty advisor for the Supernova Search Research Group. And uh, we are a group of students uh, who are, uh, we analyze telescope data from the APUS um, Wallace E. Boston Observatory, located in Charlestown, uh, West Virginia. We look at nearby galaxies for transient objects, uh, such as supernova events. Um, and, and tonight you're gonna hear from many of our students. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that you can see our wonderful telescope. This is a live feed. Uh, there is, move some of these things out of the way for a minute. So this is our telescope and uh, we're really hoping that it's going to be clear enough that we'll be able to show you some, some neat images tonight. Um, this is just before we start, I thought I'd let you see, this is what we've been looking at tonight. This, what you're seeing here on the screen, this is our all sky camera, which is mounted on top of the observatory. Uh, the lights around the edge are the horizon in Charlestown. And what this program does is it takes a picture of the sky uh, basically once a minute, and just so we have, um, you know, a real-time view of what the weather looks like and, and the cloud situation. And um, you can see this image right here is what it looked like when we logged on tonight. So not looking very good with all those clouds, but as you can see, they're slowly starting to move out. A uh, little bit of haze maybe, but we're starting to see a much clearer sky. So we are hopeful that we'll be able to, um, you know, show you some really good telescope images tonight. So we wanted to show you one of the tools that we use when we use our remote telescope. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Alvin. Thank you. Um... Kristen, I appreciate it. And the weather, weather gods are cooperating tonight. And as Kristen is configuring the telescope for observations, I wanted to give a little bit of background about the telescope. I, I was around, it's been roughly 10 years ago uh, that the telescope was installed in Charlestown, West Virginia. It sits on top of the IT building and the skies are pretty good. Charlestown, if you've ever been in that part of West Virginia, is, is not very large. And so we, um, well, I, I am just uh, for background, the department chair for space studies. And I took the position of department chair program director uh, back in January of 2016 was when the uh, telescope launched. And I've been with the university since 2011 as a faculty member. And my contribution to the project, I was always a, um, a cheerleader for the observatory project. And Originally, we had planned on going with a 12-inch plane wave um, telescope, and this would have been a, a telescope half the size of this one. So I was able to argue that we need to get the largest aperture uh, we, we can possibly afford. And it turns out that at, at the time, uh, the president of the university, Wallace E. Boston, the, the telescope is named after, was an amateur astronomer. And in fact, when he retired, I helped uh, him acquire a, a small telescope that he uses from his backyard in, uh, I believe, in Austin, Texas. But anyway, we have a 24 inch plane wave uh, CDK telescope, state of the art. Uh, that weighs in at a bit under 300 pounds. And you, you can see the dome moving. Kristen is, is configuring for initializing the telescope and dome. The telescope is pointing to the north and the dome is going to the north. The dome for scale is 22 
and a half feet across. And the telescope sits on a very large pier. If you ever get a chance <laughs> to visit the university, let me know and we can arrange a, a tour. But it sits up on top of, of the building and then is totally designed for um, robotic uh, online observation. Now, keeping in mind for scale, uh, the back of the telescope is two feet across. That's the size of the mirror, uh, 24 inches across. So this is a, a really big eye that's configured with a camera on the back, state-of-the-art SBIG, uh, ST, uh, STI, SBIG uh, camera, very, very sensitive CCD camera designed for research. So the, there's no way that you, you can put your eye up to an eyepiece, maybe the little finder on top of the telescope, but it is it is used um, for uh, research purposes. And so tonight what we're going to do, uh, what, what Kristen and uh, our students are going to do is have some fun in our virtual star party. And we're going to take a look at various celestial objects, as you see the uh, the slit opening up, exposing the clear skies over Charlestown, West Virginia. And then she's going to um, have the telescope do a little dance uh, where it will figure out where it is uh, in terms of pointing at the celestial sphere. And, and then we'll be able to uh, get up and running and she will initialize the camera uh, that will take uh, pictures. You, you can see at this orientation to the, on the pier, you, you have the main telescope uh, sitting there and then uh, to the lower right of the pier are counterweights that balance the telescope. These are really heavy weights uh, that approximate the, the weight of the telescope, close to 300 pounds. So that actually, it's pretty cool because when we were installing the instrument, it was so finely balanced that you could, you could use one finger and push the telescope. So the motors that drive the telescope, um, east and west and north and south, in right ascension and declination are not terribly large uh, to move the telescope because it is so well, well balanced. Now sitting on top of the telescope is a wide field five inch uh, Teleview refracting telescope with its own CCD camera, 8300 uh, camera that gives us a wide field view. But tonight we're gonna be using the, the big guy, the the 24 inch to look at uh, some celestial objects. Let's see, what else can we tell you about the telescope? It is um, used um, by faculty uh, in collaboration with students for um, capstone projects and other research projects. It, it's very well suited for photometry, very sensitive camera uh, that can sense brightness variations. So we can follow um, uh, variable stars or uh, we, we can look at asteroids and how, how the brightnesses of asteroids change due to their rotation on their axis and and do something called an, uh, a rotation curve, an asteroid rotation curve, where we can get the, um, the shape of, of the asteroid based on the light variation. And what, one of the most exciting things that we've been working on, our students have been doing, is um, observing galaxies, uh, searching for supernovae. These are... Um, stars, ancient stars <clears throat> in uh, very massive stars in other galaxies 
that explode at the end of their their life uh, cycle. And so that this this is a, a pretty cool project that we've been involved in, as well as taking a look, doing um, follow up observations of exoplanets. And these are planets orbiting other stars. When I first got involved in astronomy, we weren't sure uh, because we had we, we did not have evidence for planets around other stars. And so the field of astronomy has changed and our students are very fortunate that with instruments uh, of the size of our telescope and uh, larger, we can track uh, these planets as they uh, drift across the disk of a star, creating a bit of a, a very, very minor dimming uh, light fluctuation in the star. And so we can uh, produce uh, these exoplanet light curves and learn about the orbital period and nature of planets around other stars, which is totally mind boggling and exciting. So it looks like Kristen has the telescope. Is it uh, configured in STI, the software? We are good to go. We okay, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah. Dome is open. Looks like we're ready to have some fun. <laughs> yeah, we are. We're excited to get started. So thank you so much, Ed. Um, thank you for all your support and for a fantastic introduction to what we're doing. Um, what we're going to do now is um, go ahead with our our first observation and um, Ryan Nadalski, who is one of our supernova search team leads, is going to start us off by telling us about himself and about the first object we'll be observing. So Ryan, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Miller, and, and thank you, Dr. Albin. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first off, I want to thank you all for being here and joining us for this virtual star party. My name is Ryan Nadolsky, and I am the training coordinator for the Supernovae Search Group. Uh, I'm also a student uh, with APUS, a dad to three children, and in my free time, I'm also a full-time HR manager. Uh, so <laughs> a little bit of everything. Uh, but tonight, I'd like to talk to you about one of the most striking and well-studied nebulae in the night sky, and that's going to be the Helix Nebula. The Helix Nebula is also known as NGC 7293. It is a planetary nebula that is located in the constellation of Aquarius. It lies approximately 700 light years away from Earth uh, and is often referred to as the Eye of God, uh, due to its resemblance to a human eye. Uh, its vibrant colors and intricate structure make it a favorite among astronomers and space enthusiasts alike. To understand the Helix Nebula, it's important to know what a planetary nebula is. And despite the actual name, planetary ne nebula, uh, planetary nebulae have nothing to do with planets. Uh, they are formed when a medium-sized star that is similar to our sun exhausts its nuclear fuel and as that star ages, it expels its outer layers into space, creating this glowing shell of ionized gas. Uh, the core left behind uh, becomes a white dwarf. Uh, so right in that center of that big round uh, glob of gas uh, is a bright white dwarf star. Uh, the Helix Nebula is a prime example of this process. It is composed of that central white, white dwarf surrounded by that glowing shell of ionized gas. Uh, nebula spans about two and a half light years across and is one of the closest examples of this stellar phenomenon, uh, giving us a unique opportunity to study this intricate, the intricate details of such nebulae. One of the most fascinating aspects of the Helix Nebula is that structure. Uh, the nebula exhibits a complex networks of these filaments and rings, uh, which are thought to be created by the interaction of stellar winds and magnetic fields. Uh, the vibrant colors seen in images of the Helix Nebula are due to different gases uh, emitting light at various wavelengths. So for instance, hydrogen glows red while oxygen produces that greenish hue. Observations of the Helix Nebula have also provided 
valuable insights into the life cycles of stars and the processes that lead to the formation of such nebulae. So these studies actually help astronomers understand how elements are distributed throughout the galaxy, enriching the interstellar medium with materials necessary for the formation of new stars and planets. And I'd like to wrap this up you know, by saying that the Helix Nebula is not only a breathtaking object of beauty, but it is also a crucial piece in the puzzle of stellar evolution. Its study enhances our understanding of the universe and the life cycles of stars, contributing to the broader knowledge of cosmic processes. I'd like to thank you again for your time being here and thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Ryan, that was excellent. Um, so this is the um, image that we got from the telescope. We're doing one minute exposure, so we're not seeing a whole lot of detail here, um, but the um, you can see a little bit of the nebulosity here in the center. If I zoom out a little bit more, you can see it really well. Um, with a longer exposure and with a colorized exposure, we'd be able to see a lot more detail, but you can see that circular image um, that defines the nebula as well as the stars around it. We are still getting quite a bit of fuzz. Um, I think there's a bit of fog or uh, maybe some haze in the, in the atmosphere. So we're mostly clear, but um, getting a little bit of haze because normally our picture would be a little sharper, but um, but we are excited that we can at least see the nebula <laughs> and, uh, and well done, Ryan. <laughs> All right, our next object will be um, uh, is is going to be described by Nick. So Nick, we'll let you go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas Foley. I served three years in the U.S. Army as a UAV operator, and now I attend American Military University. I am pursuing a bachelor's degree in space studies with an astronomy concentration. I participate in the APIS research teams to gain hands-on experience and connections to increase my chances of higher education and employment. The celestial object I will cover is the Whirlpool Galaxy, or Messier 51. The Whirlpool Galaxy is one of the most famous objects in the night sky. The Whirlpool Galaxy was discovered by French astronomer Pierre McCain and cataloged by Charles Messier in 1773. A galaxy is defined as a collection of stars bound by gravity. The whirlpool gravity is famous for its spiraling arms and bright center. These characteristics define the whirlpool galaxy as a spiral galaxy. These cosmic giants can stretch up to tens of thousands of light years in diameter and hold over a quadrillion stars. Thank you. Nice job. Thanks, Nick. Um, as you guys can see, the, the dome is coming over. I'm going to, it's taking a little bit of time for the dome. So I'm actually going to pause this and restart it. Um, in just a minute, because the dome's not quite there, um, so that we have time to let it catch up and then get to our image. Um, our telescope has moved, just to give you a feel for where it's moved on the sky, right? It's following these blue lines, so it's come clear down over here from where it was clear back at the beginning of this blue line. Um, and you can see that it's um, the telescope is now in place and just waiting for that dome to catch up. The dome is incredibly heavy. As, as Dr. Alvin mentioned, and I, it, it's not fast, <laughs> it's not speedy, but it will get there. Um, one thing that's pretty cool in astronomy is that in, in observing is that we're able to use a feature um, which hooks the dome to, it, it makes the dome mirror what the telescope does so that wherever the telescope goes, that dome should follow. It might take a little while to get there and you can see it pauses every now and then, but, um, but it automatically slews to the same spot as the telescope. So that makes observing, uh, especially remote observing, really useful because we don't have to worry about positioning the dome. It just automatically follows after the um, after the telescope. And that's the feature that we're using tonight to do this observation. All right, I think it's just about in place. And we will go ahead and restart the script. We use remote scripts like these to um, when we're doing these observations so that the telescope can run autonomously. Um, I'm gonna restart it here. And while it's taking that image, you can see this is one of our other software. Um, you can see that we can watch the image. If you look at the little blue progress bar up here, we can actually watch as that image is being downloaded. We can see how long it takes to um, actually take the image and then to download it onto the computer. So. Um, these are just some of the tools that we use in the observatory in order to be able to 
um, observe remotely. And we always observe remotely with this. None of us are actually there at the telescope. Um, we have uh, someone who is our, our hands on the ground um, telescope person who, um, you know, can help if something gets really out of whack or needs to be reset. But for the most part, we're all just observing remotely. So um, it's pretty cool that we're able to uh, log in and access the telescope and maneuver it no matter where we are in the world. All right, you can see our little countdown here. We've got seven seconds left and we'll see what kind of image we get. I think it was a little clearer in the Western part of the sky, which is where we're looking, although it is a little bit low. So that might be into the haze. So we'll just have to see what kind of image we get out of this. It's downloaded and let's take, I'm gonna pause it so that we don't go to, there we go. So that we have a chance to, um, to look at the image. There we go. All right. So we now, ooh, nice. So here is that spiral structure um, that Nick was talking about. Um, can see why it's called the Whirlpool Galaxy, right? And, and one thing that I think is really cool about this galaxy, you can see this arm, this tendril that reaches out to the companion over here as they as they feed into each other. But um, this is a really pretty image. Again, we're getting a little bit of haze in the images. Um, but that you can really see the the structure of this galaxy very well. All right. Um, okay, so I think we'll go ahead with our next object. Um, and uh, I'm actually going to talk to us about that one. Um, while the telescope slews over to it, I'll let you have a look at the telescope. So what we're going to now is um, a nebula. So a nebula is a, a giant cloud of gas and dust in space. And while we think of them as clouds and sometimes call them clouds, they're actually very thin compared to clouds on Earth. They have densities of maybe um, 100 to 10,000 particles per cubic centimeter. And just for comparison, the Earth's atmosphere is more than two times 10 to the 19 particles per cubic centimeter. So that's two with 19 zeros after it, particles in every cubic, little cubic centimeter. Um, whereas in space you have, you know, 100 or 10,000 at most particles. So these are very thin regions, although compared to the vacuum of space, they're still pretty dense, astronomically speaking. Um, the nebula we're gonna be looking at next is called the Trifid Nebula. This is a, a what we call an H2 region in the Northwest. Um, it's in the constellation of Sagittarius in a star forming region in the Milky Way, um, one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way. Um, it was discovered by Charles Messier on June 5th, six, 1764. And its name, Trifid, means three lobes. And um, interestingly, each of the lobes is a different part of the nebulae and some of them are different kinds of nebulae. So, when you look at it, the reason it looks like it has three lobes is that there is what we call a dark nebula, which are these little dark filaments that kind of come through and they divide the nebula into three sections. And so that's how they got its name. Um, the dark lines are, the dark nebulae are, uh, it's, a, it's a dense dusty region um, that shows up as those dark lines across the image. Um, and infrared images um, can show that there are forming stars inside the dark nebula. We won't see those tonight because we're in a, uh, ours is an optical, not an infrared telescope, but that's what's inside them. Um, part of the Trifid Nebula is an emission nebula. Um, an emission nebula is a region of hot gas that emits light. And um, the Trifid's H2 region is dominated by the red light coming from ionized hydrogen. And this is the light that gives its lobes its characteristic red color. Uh, the other part of the nebula is a reflection nebula that's created by an adjacent part of the gas, the little you know space cloud essentially, that reflects the light from the emission nebula. And because the blue wavelengths are preferentially reflected or scattered, um, this nebula appears uh, maybe a greenish, bluish, purplish in the sky. All right, I am gonna pause it because we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Hold on there, little telescope. Um, there we go. I, and it looks like it's downloaded its image, so let's, Go ahead and take a look. Oh, nice, this is a clearer view of the sky. We lucked into a clear region here. Wow, and here's the Trifid Nebula. So you can see these dark regions, the dark nebulae that are dividing it into the different sections. Um, I, if you if you take images using a spectrometer or, or using a filter that can 
can do the different parts of the, the different light from it, then you can actually see um, our telescope can actually see the red and blue sections. Right now it's a black and white image because we're just looking at at uh, with a light filter. Um, but you can still see these dark nebulae that that cut through it and kind of give it its three separate parts that give the nebula its name. That's that's a pretty picture. What do you think, guys? <laughs> where it's getting clearer out there. I think we're yeah, in the right I love direction. It. I nice. love it. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. <laughs> the clearer it gets, the better these images will turn out. So <laughs> very exciting. All right. Um, we're going to go ahead next. Um, oh, I have my level order here. Okay. Next, we're going to go to M101. That's totally fine. Uh, I'll go ahead and let it start again and let you watch while the galaxy, I uh, sorry, while the telescope works its way there, it's going to a different part of the sky. Um, M101 uh, is a spiral galaxy. Uh, so it is a type of galaxy, a spiral galaxy is a type of galaxy that has sort of three different parts. It has a central bulge in the middle. It has um, the spiral arms that wrap around it. And then it has a halo and sometimes a central bar. Our Milky Way galaxy is also a spiral galaxy and ours does have a central bar. Um, the Pinwheel galaxy, I believe does not have a bar though. Um, but it does have beautiful arms and that's how it gets its name, um, much like the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, M101 is a face-on uh, counterclockwise spiral galaxy. It's located about 21 million light years away or six megaparsecs from Earth. It's in the constellation of Ursa Major. Um, it was discovered in 1781. It's estimated to hold one trillion stars just in this one galaxy, pretty amazing. Um, and the arms are bright because they are regions where active star formation is taking place. It has a, a visual magnitude in the sky of about 7.9, which makes it very, very bright. Um, let's see, where are we? Oh, I think we might be, let's see, I think we are, oh yeah, okay. It's starting to take the image here. Oh, there's our progress bar, so we can watch it moving. Um, one thing that's cool while we're waiting for it to take the image, this is a nice view of that camera and the finder scope from the telescope. Um, as you as we take the different images and the telescope moves to different parts of the sky, you'll be able to see different parts of the telescope. Sometimes uh, you can see the secondary mirror at the top. Sometimes you can see, you know, the detector at the back. It's uh, kind of interesting. We pick these objects to kind of try to give you um, lots of different views of the telescope as it went. Um, through the different objects. So we're in, a, we're in kind of a different portion of the sky. So we'll see what we get in terms of how clear things are. We've got about 14 seconds left for this observation. I always like to watch the little countdown. It's kind of like a little <laughs> launch to your, <laughs> your object. All right. Going to download that object. I am going to pause this here. Um, yeah, pause it right there. And let's take a look and see how the image turned out. Oh, this one's back in the fuzz a little bit, it looks like, unfortunately, but hopefully we'll still be able to see. Oh, you can still see the galaxy. There's that bright central bulge. Here you can see the arms. You can kind of trace them out. There's one going there, one coming out here. A um, couple, a little bit of the structure. It's unfortunate that this part of the sky is a little bit, a little bit clouded over again. But um, you can still see that beautiful bright nucleus uh, where the majority of the stars are in some of the star forming regions along the arms. So, kind of a fun object. All right. Um, let's see our next object, uh, Melissa. I think we're going to you next. Um, for the sunflower, a different galaxy. So I will go ahead and start this and um, let you take it away. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone is uh, doing well this evening. Um, as Dr. Miller said, my name is Melissa West and um, I graduated AMU last year with a space studies degree concentrating in astronomy. Uh, I love the work the group does um, towards academia and astronomy, and I'm proud to be part of it as it's an alum alumna. I am the website coordinator for the group. Um, our website tells you what projects we're involved with, uh, some of our telescopic detections, and articles written by members of our group. 
And I can post a link to that for you guys um, so you guys can check it out. And tonight, I would like to talk about M63, commonly known as the Sunflower Galaxy. So the Sunflower Galaxy is classified as a flocculent spiral galaxy. And what that means is that it doesn't have well-defined spiral arms, as opposed to the grand design look uh, like the Whirlpool Galaxy that we saw earlier. But uh, technically, it has two arms, as you can see in infrared imaging, and they are wound up uh, very tightly around the bright core which is why it looks like the galaxy has numerous arms. Uh, this configuration gives M63 a flowery appearance, hence the name the sunflower. Uh, so a little bit of history. It was discovered by French astronomer Pierre Michat in 1779 and cataloged by Messier in uh, three years later. And then 10 years after that, William Herschel looked at it and described it as a very bright nebula with a very bright nucleus. Uh, its spiral structure wasn't identified until 1850, when English astronomer William Parsons noted it as a spiral nebula. Uh, some basic facts about it, it's um, about 27 million light years away. It's about the same size as our Milky Way galaxy. Um, you can find it in the northern skies between Ursa Major uh, and Keynes Venatici. Um, it has an, uh, an apparent magnitude of 9.3, meaning that you will need a telescope uh, to help you see it under dark skies because it, because it goes beyond our limit of what our eyes can see. Uh, our limit is uh, 6 on the magnitude scale. Uh, if you use a 3-inch telescope, uh, you will see like a small fuzzy patch. Uh, if you use a 6-inch telescope, uh, you'll be able to see its bright core surrounded by some fuzziness. And using an eight inch telescope will allow you to see the entire spiral structure. Uh, some notable discoveries in M63 are um, back in 1971, there was a type one supernova. And really quick, uh, this type of supernova occurs when a white dwarf in a binary system accumulates enough mass from its partner to set off an, ex set off an explosion. Uh, type ones are very beneficial in astronomy because they serve as this as a distance tool known as a standard candle, and they help measure distances to objects because they give off about the same intrinsic brightness. And what they do is they plug in that brightness into a formula, and then you can get a uh, a distance number. <laughs> um, and then in 1979, uh, astronomers found a tidal stellar stream in the halo region of the galaxy. Uh, this indicated some disturbance with one of the several dwarf galaxies that surround M63 uh, over the past few billion years. And if you invert this image, the stream will look like dark arcs around the galaxy. Uh, so there you have it. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the Sunflower Galaxy and thank you for your time. Nice job, thank you so much, Melissa, that was excellent. Here's our picture of the Sunflower Galaxy. Um, you can see its bright nucleus here. We're getting a little bit too much fuzz to see anything else, but you can see how bright and pretty it is in the middle. And, um, you know, in a clear image, you'll be able to get more of that sunflower look to it. But that was an excellent description of it. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, let's see. I think our next observation let me sorry move a couple of things around so i can get to it um our next observation um is ngc 66 oh i'm sorry yes ngc 6633 um this is a different type of object than we've looked at before uh this is actually an open cluster so it's a, a bright, a large, bright open cluster in the constellation of Ophiuchus. Um, an open cluster, it's a group of stars. They're very loosely bound uh, together and they're often found in, usually in, in spiral or um, sometimes irregular galaxies. They're made up of relatively young stars. Um, so when you find them in spiral galaxies, they're found in the spiral arms where that new star formation is occurring. Uh, they're not very stable, so they don't stay together very long, which is how we know that when we find them, then they have to be pretty young, because if you wait too long, then the stars all disperse. Um, 
this particular um, open cluster was discovered in uh, 1745 um, and independently rediscovered by Caroline Herschel in 1783. Caroline Herschel is a big name in astronomy. Um, she did uh, a lot of work with astronomical catalogs and a lot of really amazing work in the early days of astronomy. Um, open clusters, while they're not as bright as globular clusters, they are very interesting to observe because you can easily separate out the individual stars. And they're very important for understanding stellar evolution. Um, open clusters generally can contain about from a few tens to a few hundreds of stars. Um, this one that we're going to be looking at now, it's starting to expose the light. Um, this one has about 38 known stars. It's about um, 1.4 thousand light years from Earth, has a magnitude in the sky of about 4.6, um, and in, we believe it's about 660 million years old. And I know you're all thinking, wait, I thought you said these were young, but actually 660 million years is very young astronomically speaking. So this is just, you know, a new little cluster in our sky. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to see some of the, it has some very bright stars in it, and hopefully we'll be able to see some of those bright stars. Um, you'll notice we're looking at a very different region of the sky. The telescope's now pointing straight up. You can see the secondary mirror here. So the light comes in, it reflects off the primary mirror, goes up to the secondary, and then comes down here through to the detector. So you've got a really nice view of that in this orientation. Um, let's see, we're done observing. I'm going to pause it for a minute. Oh, yep, yeah, we're there. So that we can, there we go. Uh, so we can take a look at the object. Let's see how it looks. Oh, overhead is looking pretty clear. That's happy. Let's see how this object turned out. All right, so. <laughs> Looks kind of like a star field. If I if I zoom out a lot, I'm gonna take this one out because it kind of distracts you a little bit. Uh, and that one too. There we go. Um, if you look at it, this kind of loose grouping of bright stars here, this is the open cluster. So it's not this stunning, you know, cluster of stars all tightly together like a globular cluster, but it's kind of cool because you can see all these different individual stars. And if we um, zoom in a little bit, you know, you can really see these little stars all together. It's kind of fun because they all, um, oops, would have, um, formed at about the same time. They're all loosely gravitationally bound now, but, but moving away from each other. So, um, but some really beautiful stars on the night sky. And, uh, I like this image. I hope you like it too, because it's, um, a really pretty, a uh, clear image of how beautiful the night sky is. So, all right, that's our open cluster. Um, we're gonna head next to a nebula and uh, Selena, uh, oh wait, I'm so sorry. We're heading next to, I'm out of order. We're heading next to a globular cluster. Melissa, we're coming back to you for the globular cluster. So this is perfect. And now everyone's going to look at the globular cluster and be like, oh, that's so much more beautiful because they're like stunning. But I think uh, that the, you know, the the open clusters are still pretty cool. So uh, I'll let you take it away, Melissa. <laughs> Thanks again, Dr. Mila. Another... Hi, everyone, again. All right. Um, So a little bit more about me. Um, I started with the group about three years ago. And back then, me and my family, we were stationed overseas. So gaining a hands-on experience in this field was a challenge. Um, when I learned about the Supernova Research Group, I got excited. I submitted an interest form and began work working with the data all within about a week. Uh, the dynamics of the group are very supportive and kind. Uh, if you have a question, there's always someone there to answer it. Or if you need advice, uh, someone's there to offer their two cents. And it's one of the reasons why I've continued to be a part of it even after I graduated last year. All right, so back to business. I will talk about M75. So M75 is a beautiful jewel box of about 400,000 stars bound to together by gravity. This globular cluster is the most centrally concentrated and because of that is nicknamed the crowded cluster. Um, some basic facts about it. It is about 67,500 light years away, and it resides in the halo region of our galaxy. 
um, its position on the other side of the galactic center from our point of view. You can typically find it west of the Sagittarius constellation in the southern skies. Um, if you're looking for Sagittarius, it kind of looks like a teapot, uh, just to make it easier for you to find. Uh, M75 stars are about 13 billion years old. Uh, its age and location have led astronomers to conclude that this cluster came from the last galaxy merger the Milky Way encountered about 10 billion years ago. And that was with a small dwarf galaxy called the Sausage Galaxy. Additionally, M75's age is the ideal candidate to study stellar populations, metallicity, and intermediate sized black holes. Uh, the cluster has a luminosity of 180,000 times our sun, and luminosity is the total power an object emits. And lastly, it has an apparent magnitude of eight and a half, making it hard to see with our eyes. Uh, because of its dim nature, classifying it in the early 19th century was a bit of a challenge. Uh, Michan first discovered it in 1780, and he noted that the cluster was a nebula without a star. A few months later in October, Messier uh, officially cataloged it as a group of small stars. It took another 30, year, 30 years for Herschel to resolve the individual stars using his 20-foot Newtonian telescope, and he classified it as a official globular cluster in 1810. Uh, his note stated that this cluster was a mini version of M3, which is a larger, more loosely bound cluster. Uh, and then 20 years after that, his son revisited M75 and noted it as an in insignificant object, that's small and dim except towards the middle, where it's noticeably brighter. I mean, M75 is visible with a set of binoculars under dark sky conditions, but you will need at least a 10-inch telescope to resolve some of the individual stars. Uh, thank you again for your time, and I hope you enjoy learning about M75. Thanks so much, Melissa. That was excellent. Um, and you can see here this beautiful um, globular cluster. They really do have the wow factor. They're pretty, um, pretty spectacular objects with so many stars that um, it is really incredibly difficult to uh, to view each one inside it in <laughs> a space telescope to really do a decent job of that. But um, but from the ground, we can see how beautiful they are and how bright they are in our sky. I think they're really cool objects. So thank you so much. All right, now we are going to, let's see, let me make sure I get this right. Um, now we are going to a completely different object. We're going back to a nebula. And Selena, I think you're going to tell us about this one. Is that right? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Selena Pena. I am an APUS alumni. I graduated last year with my master's in space studies with a concentration of astronomy. Um, I have been part of the Supernova Research Group for a little over two years now. So I feel blessed to be with an awesome group of um, astronomers. I am also a middle school and high school science educator in South Dakota. So I'm excited that I was able to start the first year of high school astronomy at, at my school. So tonight I'm pleased, I am pleased to share information about the Ring Nebula tonight. First, this is just a teacher in me. I always have to have you guys kind of consider these questions um, or some questions to think about. So I would like you to consider um, some questions about these celestial objects. So what secrets does this colorful nebula hold about stellar evolution? How does the, the interplay of light and matter shape our understanding of the universe? So join us as we explore the fascinating life, uh, life cycle of stars and the stunning visual of this ring nebula. So the ring nebula, you may also know it as the M57 or NGC 6720. It's actually one of the most well-known planetary nebulae in the night sky. So it's located in the constellation Lyra and it's about 2,300 light years away from Earth. The nebula, or nebula was discovered in 1779 by Pelipua 
uh, a French astronomer, just a few days before Charles Messier cataloged it as an M57. Um, the Ring Nebula was formed when a star similar in size to our beautiful sun reached the end of its life. So the star's outer layers were ejected into space, creating the nebula, while the star's core remains as hot as a white dwarf. So that's at the center. Um, so when you look at it, um, it can be viewed through a telescope. Um, the nebula looks like a glowing ring or a donut. That would probably be Homer Simpson's favorite, right? Um, so it does have bright and colorful outer shell and a fainter interior. So the ring is actually a projection of a more complex three-dimension shape. So those are glowing, it's a glowing gas shell that's expelled by a dying star. The nebula actually, um, its apparent magnitude is about 8.8 eight under dark skies you would not be able to see it with the naked eye um the size of the nebula is one light year across so that's approximately 5.9 trillion miles um or kilometers it's 9.5 trillion kilometers oh that's gorgeous so the center of the star like i said um white dwarf um remnant of an original star that was create that created the nebula. The temperatures at the center there, if you can kind of, you could probably kind of see, but you can't, you don't know, but it's over a hundred thousand degrees Celsius. Um, if you want to know about the colors, it's fascinating if you were to see it in color um, or add that it is ionized by intense ultraviolet radiation from the central star. So you have hydrogen that'll glow red, the oxygen appears greenish blue, and then the nitrogen and sulfur, that'll give off a red and yellow hues. So this is, again, the Ring Nebula or M57 offers an excellent example of what happens when stars like our sun reach the end of their life cycles, providing a glimpse into the future of our solar system. So I encourage you to engage with the night sky, use the telescope to observe these, these celestial wonders and deepen your understanding of the cosmos. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Selena. You did a fantastic job. We appreciate it. All right. It's a cool nebula. Very cool nebula. Um, Terry, I, are you on? I think. I am here. You are here. Wonderful. So I think you're going to tell us about our next object, a globular cluster. Is that right? Lucky, Yeah, lucky me, too. I, I picked a good one. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as uh, <clears throat> as Wally, as we affectionately call our telescope, um, slews around. Actually, actually, it looks like it's moving as complete, so it'll start taking the image pretty quickly. So I'll move quickly. Uh, M56, also NGC. Uh, 6779 is a glob cluster. Uh, we call it a glob. Oh, and, and real quick about me. I'm, I manage the telescope for the university. I work underneath uh, Dr. Albine and Dr. Miller and have been uh, the assistant manager of the telescope for um, almost four years, a little under four years. And, you know, it's a uh, university grade. So what we see is, is amazing from this, this machinery. Um, M56 discovered by Messier, of course, practically every, all of the big, highly visible clusters and globs were all discovered by Charles. On a good night, you might see this with your, with your naked eye. You probably would, would need just a, a pair of binoculars even. It's a little fuzzy in the binoculars, but as we start to resolve, in fact, uh, I'm sitting in front of a, uh, RGB version, a uh, red, green, blue version of the of the same cluster behind me, and um, this thing is absolutely massive. It's thirty two thousand nine hundred light years away, and uh, it's also eight point eight point nine magnitude. So it's incredibly bright. 
it has a solar mass. So we, we, we measure these globular clusters by their mass. And, and this has a solar mass of 230,000 solar masses. It's, uh, as it relates to its width, it is, I wrote it down, it's, uh, I did it in miles, 495,006, excuse me, 495 million, 600,000 miles across. Um, so it's kind of small. And, and the other thing that's fascinating about it is, so we all, we all, if we're in the business or if we understand astronomy and, and you, you hear that number all the time, 14.6 billion years is, is kind of the approximate age of our universe. Uh, in, in this case, um, this globular cluster is 13.7, estimated to be 13.7 billion years in age. It, um, it has a relatively high metallicity. And so th that is important. A couple of reasons why that's important. If it, if it has a lot of what we call uh, population one stars, population one stars are not original stars. So it's, it's opposite. Pop three are the original stars. Pop one are kind of the second and third generation stars. And wow, look at that. God. Wow, look how bright it is. Anyway, er, er, anytime I'm, have the opportunity to work on this telescope and these images come up, you're like, wow, you're looking at, of course it's light. It's a good bazillion million years, a jillion, bajillion years old, but it's, uh, it's just amazing to see. Uh, but the metallicity is important because it tells us that, you know, there's a likelihood that some of those stars might have planets that are rotating around it and they might have the capacity for life. And, it's so far away, we'll never know, but uh, unless they contact us first. And, uh, and, and as it is, it's, uh, it's just an amazing uh, glob. It's, uh, it's X-ray emission is spectacular. And if we had an X-ray um, telescope, I'd want to use it. But it is also part of Gaia sausage as well as what you were hearing from, uh, from uh, Mel a few minutes ago. But there we are. Welcome to... Welcome to my world. This thing is spectacular. M56. You got to get a piece of it when you can. <laughs> so true. It's gorgeous. Thank you so much, Terry. Bet. All right. Last but certainly not least, uh, Keston, I think you're going to tell us about our final object and the Eagle Nebula, right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> oh, that's my cue. Sorry. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, wherever you are in the world right now. I just wanted to thank you for being here for this stellar presentation, pun intended. Uh, my name is Kesson Den Alter, and I graduated last year from APUS with a Bachelor's of Space Studies uh, with a concentration in astronomy. Um, I'm still a student at APUS, working on my Master's now of Space Studies and Astronomy Concentration as well. And since working on my Master's, I've also got involved with two research groups at APUS, the first being the Supernova Research Group, which we're, we're here with all tonight, scanning several different portions of the night sky with our university's amazing telescope and searching for active exploding stars or supernova. The second is ARG, the Analog Astronaut Research Group, as an analog astronaut performing research in high fidelity analog habitats. The habitats are built to mimic natural space and planetary environments. And I'm, look, I'm actually looking forward to my first mission at SAM, the Space Analog Moon and Mars Habitat, uh, located at the University of Arizona in February 2025. So really looking forward to that. Um, but, you know, for the reason why we're here, without further ado, let's dive into it. Tonight, I will give you a short presentation on the magnificent Messier 16 Emission Nebula, more commonly known as the Eagle Nebula. Located in the Serpens constellation and with an apparent magnitude of 6.4, the Eagle Nebula is very bright and easy to spot from the northern or the southern hemisphere. When gazing upon it without a light filter, you can appreciate the beauty of the colors and contrast within the nebula. Looking up at the nebula here soon, I'm sure we are all familiar, but want to remind everyone, we are looking at an object that's 7,000 light years away. This would also mean that we are seeing this nebula how it looked 7,000 years ago from today because of light only traveling at a specific speed. Now, the Eagle Nebula was first discovered by the Swiss astronomer, bear with me here, Jean-Philippe Lloyd de Chassois in 1745. It was named, of course, because if you look really hard here soon and squint your eyes, you may be able to see the nebula in the shape of an eagle with its wings outspread. 
When the Hubble Space Telescope was first launched into space back in 1990, one of the images it took that made it famous was actually of the Eagle Nebula, particularly something further within. If I could shift your attention further to the top portion of the nebula here in a second, um, we may not be able to get a close glance of it because this was, you know, of course, taken with the space telescope, but some of you may already know where I'm going with this. Within the nebulae lies a series of three large pillars of cloud and dust. These are known as the pillars of creation. And the more you learn about them, the more impressive they are. Now, each pillar stands several light years tall and around four to five light years across. And the cloud's pillars are aptly named the pillars of creation because they represent an active star forming region within the nebula, frequently creating newborn stars hidden within the clouds. There we are now. <laughs> um, depending on the wavelength you were looking at the pillars, the stellar nursery portrays immense ultraviolet light from the newborn stars, powerful radiation. Unfortunately, due to the high number of young stars located within, there is also a large number of supernova. These supernova explosions send ripples through the cosmos, which are separating the clouds of the nebulae and its appearance more and more, leading many scientists to believe that the picture that we see now of the pillars is probably gone and doesn't look exactly like the beautiful pillars of creation that we enjoy. We are looking at this 7,000 years ago, and it is highly unlikely that it will look the same in the future. Um, the different colors of the nebula represent different elements that you can see with the full um, visible light um, and infrared wavelength to be able to go through uh, the clouds, with the blue resembling oxygen, red is sulfur, and green being both nitrogen and hydrogen. And lastly, a fun fact, if we are looking up close at the pillars of creation, and I, I advise all you guys, if you guys can uh, get a chance to look at it yourselves as well, um, a fun fact is that... Uh, can be seen with an up close of the pillars is on the right side of the first pillar uh, appears to be the side of a man's face half, halfway up the first pillar, which is just a fun kind of neat detail um, that's pretty interesting and brought it to its fame. Well, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed M16 and learned a little on the way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keston. What a beautiful image to end on too. <laughs> this is a great one. <laughs> well, everyone, that is all that we have for you tonight. Those are the observations. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. We might have time for one or two quick questions. If there's anything in the chat, I haven't actually been um, looking at the chat. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, there there are a few. Mm -hmm. uh, the last one, I'm just gonna start from the bottom and go up. Uh, Rob Lyons, do you have, do you do any pretty pictures with the scope? Yeah, uh, we do RGB, right? That's the, the red, green, blue. Uh, it's it's a little more of a, of a challenge because um, you have to take several images of red, several of blue, several of green, and then you have to stack them and, and kind of pull them together. As you can see right now, the pillars, you can actually see the pillars in this image. That is, I have to be really frank, we've, we've rarely have images this yeah, right. year. Right there, yeah. Terry, is yeah. what you're, you're pointing out is Beautiful. the eagle. The, um, you can wow. see it looks like an eagle with its wings uh, sort of pulled up as if it were in a dive to snag some prey. That is unbelievable. And, Look at that. Yeah, to, to get the really pretty pictures and for scientific data, as Terry mentioned, we stack images. And if we want color images, we, we do red, green, and blue in our as well as luminance, which is uh, typically the longer exposure or stacking of images to bring out detail and reduce noise. But we were tonight, we were focused on seeing as many astronomical objects as possible. And I, I think our students and uh, Dr. Miller did a, did a great job swinging the telescope around it's pretty impressive the, the number of celestial objects that we looked at in, within a period of an hour and do dr miller was used and you could see as she um was moving the telescope we we use a script called orchestrate that allows us to rapidly bounce from one object to another and this is actually used by our supernova group to uh, rapidly look at as many galaxies as possible in a single night, literally dozens of galaxies in the search for exploding stars. Yeah. 
Awesome. It's a great question. Thanks for sending that question in. Um, I, I think we're at our, our hour that we promised. So um, I, I don't know, I, I guess we have to end. <laughs> we never want to end when we're, when we're on the telescope, it's always fun, but I just, I just at the end want to thank each of our students who did a fantastic job. Um, you guys did so well and gave us so much really fascinating information about each of these objects. Thank you so much. And thanks for being part of the APUS Supernova Search Group. Um, and thank you to everyone watching tonight. We hope that you enjoyed getting a peek at um, the kind of images we can create and um, our, our lovely telescope. This is kind of a, a really nice parting shot of it where you can see everything, see it so well, um, kind of pointing up and a little bit towards you. So um, um, if, you, if you have any final remarks, we can certainly go on for a few minutes. That would That would be okay, it's up to you. Oh, okay. Um, Dr. Allen, do you want to do some, a as our as our fearless leader, do you want to give a final remarks? <laughs> uh, well, I, I was just scanning to see if we have any other questions that that might have slipped slipped by. but um, I, did, I didn't find any. Okay. Well, we do appreciate everyone uh, tuning in uh, tonight and also for... Uh, bringing clear skies, as I like to say, so that we can look at the cosmos. It seems, yes, we we pray to the sky gods. Uh, what, what happens is whenever you open an observatory, we're almost convinced, those folks that have been doing this for some time, that there are clouds out there and they're looking for telescopes aimed at the sky and they sneak in and try to cover us up, but they, they were very kind. Uh, to us tonight. But again, as Dr. Miller said, thanks to um, uh, Terry, uh, our faculty, and our students, Dr. Miller, um, for orchestrating this uh, Celestial Star Party. And this is something I, I think that we'll do on a more regular basis. It, it, it's a lot of fun. And um, if we have more time, we can stack, uh, perhaps uh, look at fewer images and stack them to bring in more detail. But tonight we wanted to really just show you the telescope doing its dance, moving around, which is pretty cool to see a, a 600 plus pound uh, beast of a optical instrument. <laughs> move around as it does, as well as the 22-foot uh, uh, diameter dome uh, moving around. So we, um, again, thank everybody for attending. And if you're interested in astronomy at both uh, the undergraduate level and graduate level, uh, we have a, a Bachelor of Science and a Master's of Science in Space Studies with a concentration in astronomy. And so this is something that came about uh, with the installation of the telescope, uh, really precisely 10 years ago, uh, 2014 uh, going into 2015. And so our uh, wonderful um, eye on the sky has been busy on most clear nights over the past 10 years. <laughs> thanks and everyone been, thanks for being here with thanks, us tonight yeah thank you thank you <laughs> thanks, Dr. thanks, Dr. thanks so much guys thank you everyone and we'll see you tomorrow all, all right. right see you tomorrow see you <laughs> <laughs> bye bye Good night, everyone bye now